So the next speaker would be Joe Mo. Um, Joe has been active in the Colonize Occupy Shuttle and is a member of the Black Orchid Collective. It's a martial art uh, organization, but based in Shuttle. So Joe Mo has been part of a broader community that has been forefronting race, class struggle, gender, and international solidarity within uh, the movement. So let's all welcome Joe. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm really honored to be in the Philippines and have been in many conversations with Filipino anarchists, I mean, anarchists and activists, and been learning a lot. So um, it, it's really inspiring to know that we are in one global struggle together. So what happens in the, in the US, what happens in Southeast Asia is not separate, but they're really connected. Um, so just to introduce myself a little bit, thank you for the introduction. Um, I identify as an anti-state communist. So I know that might be pretty contentious in this space, but broadly defined, what I see being an anti-state communist is, is someone who um, you know, believes that our worth as human beings in this society is not determined only by our, our ability or inability to work for ca under capitalism. I don't think our worth as human beings should be defined by the work that we do under the system. And another aspect of being an anti-state communist is that I believe that there's enough productive capacities in our society right now that there's abundance, there should be abundance everywhere. Scarcity is a myth. Scarcity is a myth that's created by the capitalists to make us fight one another, to divide amongst us. But there's actually enough going on enough food, enough, you know, technology, everything in this society, and we should be able to share. And also, just broadly, I believe in, I'm not for hierarchy, autonomous organizing, things like that. And I'm also speaking as someone who was involved in the decolonized Occupy movements in the West Coast. So I'm not from Occupy Wall Street, I'm not from New York, I'm from Seattle, which is on the West Coast, and that's where all my networks and organizing have been. Um, so I want to start off by just um, talking about this term decolonize. Some of the disagreements actually that have been going on within the broad Occupy movement in the U.S. And two things that stand out to me are, first, the critique of the 99% slogan. I think everyone has heard, we are the 99%, right? And there, there actually have been debates within the camps about this slogan. And the second thing is the term occupy. And you know, there have been people, myself included, who have been pushing for the term decolonize. And I'll explain why. So with decolonize, you know, we, in Seattle we came out with a declaration of decolonization. And in that document, which is on the internet, um, we talked about how the term occupy has a lot of imperialist and colonization connotations of like, where do you occupy? In the US, the history of the US is an occupation. You know, it's an occupation of native land. We are on stolen native land, and we want to remember that history and say, you know, the, this, this movement that's coming up right now, it's not calling for a new occupation. It's not calling for a new American dream. The American dream has never worked. It has only worked for certain people in the U.S. society. It has not worked for black people. It has not worked for indigenous people. It has not worked for a lot of immigrant people who have moved to the United States. So we are not trying to reclaim the American dream when we, have, when we, when we are part of this movement. We are saying we need to decolonize. The U.S. needs to not be in everybody's business. It needs to get out of Africa, Asia, Latin America. We want to send a message globally that Iraq is also the 99%. Afghanistan is the 99% too. It's not just the US. So decolonization, we are pushing for decolonization to deliver that message globally. But we also thought the term occupy is really important. And we use the term occupy not in the colonization sense, but in a sense of what you have defined, of workers and communities that have reclaimed land, reclaimed the commons, land that had belonged to them before. So there have been worker struggles all around the world, in Argentina, in China, all around the world that have occupied workplaces. 
So we called ourselves Decolonize Occupy, and all this was written up in a declaration that passed in the General Assembly. It was a very heated debate um, that was going on. And part of you know, our critiques around the 99% slogan is tied to the debates around Decolonize, um, is that we are not unified. We are not all the 99%. Like, there's a lot of divisions within American society, within, in the world. You know, we're divided by race, by gender. There's a lot of, I mean, this is how capitalism works. Capitalism creates a division of labor that is racialized and gendered. So when you go to the US, when you're on the streets, the people cleaning the streets are usually black people or brown people, they're immigrant people. They are not, very few white people are doing the dirty work in society. And I'm not saying there's not poor white people, there are a lot of poor white people, but there's also the reality of racism, you know, patriarchy, macho behavior, homophobia, transphobia, and we are not all united, and we need to aim towards that unity. The 99% is, is a goal, but it's not a current reality. And this is important to point out because in the camps, when people experience patriarchy, there was instances of sexual violence, you know, rape, molest, that was going on in these camps. And there were times when if you bring anything up like that, people would be like, you are dividing the movement. We are the 99%. We shouldn't be talking about racism. We shouldn't be talking about patriarchy. And so it was very important for us to say, no, we want to be the 99%, but we have to work on these divisions that we have. So um, then, so I'll give a little bit of the context I'm coming from. And again, you know, the terms that I'm using are really um, coming from a US context. But um, two terms that I'll throw around quite a bit are the terms liberals and social democrats. And again, I'm coming from an anti-state communist perspective that you know, I work really closely with anarchists, other anti-authoritarian radical leftists, and some of the challenges that we face are with um, liberals and social democrats. And by liberals, the, the clearest liberal in my mind is Obama. Obama's a liberal. He's someone who talks a lot about human rights, but first you have to convince him that you're a human being. So, you know, he talks a lot about human rights, but then there's war in Afghanistan. He's pushing a lot of, you know, invasions in the Middle East. And so we have come across a lot of liberals who talk the good talk about human rights, but what they mean is something that's very individualized. They're not talking about mass collective liberation. They're talking about individuals. What rights do you have? And they're not talking about the environments which will make it possible for people to exercise their rights, right? So these are liberals. And social democrats are people whom I think are a little bit more left than the liberals. They support the welfare state. And in the US, we have this term called the New Deal that came out from the 1930s. It's a, it's a unity between the government and certain sectors of the left, and in this case, unions, to push forward kind of a welfare state. To say, oh, we'll give social services to everyone, but then, you know, the ideology is still pretty capitalist. It's not, it's not fighting for anti-capitalism, it's still supporting the market. And, um, yeah, and so it's with these people that we have quite a lot of disagreements with. And so I'll talk about what's unique, what I think is unique about Decolonize Occupy Seattle. And I guess some of the highlights that I don't know if people here have heard about is the West Coast port shutdown. I don't know if people here have heard about it. I guess not. Okay, so in December, all of the West Coast, well not all, but many of the West Coast ports in the US, so we're talking Seattle, Portland, Oakland, Los Angeles, the major ports where a lot of shipment from Asia are coming through shut down for a day. And they, they were shut down by community people, young people like us, you know, workers, people who worked at Starbucks, people who worked at coffee shops, teachers, we all came out and we shut down the port. It was a really big deal. And, you know, the reasons for doing that, we were saying this is Wall Street on the waterfront, right? Wall Street's not just in New York. It's in different parts of the country as well. And um, we had our own demands that was really important, we were saying, because at that time, the Occupy um, protests were really attacked by the police. 
in, in the US. So I don't know if people have seen pictures of the pepper spraying, the beatings going on in New York. And we were saying, and in Seattle we had that too, a lot of pepper spray. Our friends were sprayed through the ears, so the chemicals would go into her face, through her sinuses, and it was terrible. Um, so these, so we were saying, you know, no to police brutality, no to austerity, budget cuts, and um, we were putting out our own demands as a as a broad grouping of people, and we were also supporting um, the port truckers, who are mainly immigrants, uh, East African immigrants, who are not in unions. There's a lot of discrimination against them. They're called monkeys by people who work at the ports, and we were supporting them too. And then also other port workers who were in the in the ILWU, in the International Longshore Workers Union. And they were fighting um, against union busting. They were fighting for their contract. So we organized this West Coast port shutdown. There was this networking, really dynamic, um, going on from below grassroots. And then, you know, that's one highlight. Another highlight, I think, is the camps. I think we had the life of a camp. Like, you know, it makes me think of what I read that you guys was talking about. Um, we saw in practice this idea of from each according to ability to each according to need. And again, like there's a lot of contradictions. It's not perfect, you know, but then we saw with the camps, you had nurses who would come out, you had cooks who would come out, you had teachers who would come out to offer their services. They're not paid. They're just, they're people who have kids at home, bring their kids out. Their free time, they're doing this to be part of this vibrant community. And I think anyone who lives in the US would know American society is so isolated. It's so, there's no community space, and the camps were a, a space where people could come out and actually hang out with their neighbors, because everyone's so afraid of each other, and to have those camps where people were able to contribute what they could, it was a very dynamic environment. And also, that there was a lot of investment in the decisions that were, that were taking place, and we didn't have a full consensus model, but, you know, so many times in society, we can either choose A or B. With the elections, you either choose Obama, the Repu uh, Democrats, or Mitt Romney, the Republicans. And you don't have a third choice. You don't have a fourth choice. You can't, you know, everyone's giving you the argument, you have to choose the lesser of two evils, right? So you don't have much of a choice, but then in the camps, in our General Assembly, people were really invested. They were like, I don't agree with this. I'm gonna block this. When you block something, then, the whole discussion has to start all over again. It can get really frustrating. But then the key thing is people were invested in decisions and you know, and I think you become a different person when you know that your opinions matter, that they have implications. And then there was just a very dynamic environment of debate, um, conversation. People would be, you know, arguing with each other but then go out for drinks together after, after the thing. But okay, um, so, I think I'm going to talk just in two minutes what I think made um, the organizing in Seattle really dynamic. Is that with anti authoritarian communities, we are so small, we are so fragmented. Like, you know, in, in, in the US, you have the Trotskyists um, who are really, who have bigger parties, and then you have the Democrats who are humongous, and they're constantly trying to co opt you. And in Seattle, what we had was these small communities, small anti authoritarian communities. We started coming together, we developed our relationships over a few years, and one of the issues that we had um, united around was actually budget cuts in the education sector. And you know, I'm curious to know if there's organizing around this also um, over here, but then it was a huge issue in 2009. A lot of um, campuses were getting cut and limited access to education. So that's one of the issues that we came together around, and there was, time to build relationships, trust, community, so that when Occupy happened, we could go in united. Um, and then, I guess study and analysis, we did a lot of studying. I think not, all of us, I would say most of us are not academics in the university, but we, we study really hard, we read a lot. I would say that a lot of public intellectuals, organic intellectuals, people who study in prisons, um, people who read on their own and you know there just was a valuing of theory and analysis and history and that was really important because 
we don't want um, intellectual thought to be monopolized by the universities. We don't want professors to monopolize intellectual thought. We were like, you know, workers can think for ourselves. You know, community people, we should have access to this knowledge too. So that was really important in helping us. Having an understanding of labor history was really important for us in navigating the port shutdown, the dynamics around that. There were people who were like, you, you young workers who work at Starbucks, you're not real workers. You shouldn't be taking part in a union struggle. You know, and so we were able to respond to that by being like, what's your idea of the working class that only certain layers get to define what being a worker is? And this is especially important in the US where you have a lot of deindustrialization. And actually the population of union workers is only 11% in the US. Um, and then we also put a lot of emphasis on feminist, multiracial, um, queer liberation, LGBTQ, Liberation. And there's a lot of problems, challenges that we face too, but then um, because we're very intentional about it in our marches, we're always talking about gender, always talking about you know issues that, that um, queer people face. We brought together a lot of people who were interested in those issues. And so the dynamics of the movement change. But I need to stop right now. <laughs> Thank you, John.